siguiente. Hello? 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 Welcome back, everybody. We are going to start the first panel discussion about the transforming research assessment for next generation. We have four uh, excellent panelists here with us today. We have Sara de Richte, Manuel Franco, Jensi Flores, and Pablo Bomonaro. Um, we, they are going to start with a 10 minutes presentation for con contextualization of the debate, and then we will open the questions for you. Um, as a reminder, you can use the Mentimeter and you can use also the microphones. I'm going to give the floor to Sara first. Sara is Professor of Science, Technology and Innovation Studies, and she is Scientific Director at CWTS at Leiden University. She is also co-chair of the Research on Research Institute, RORI. She is specialized in social studies of research evaluation, and she considers that in relation to epistemic cultures, knowledge infrastructures, valuation processes, and roles of research in and for society. Sara has a strong international public academic presence with global outreach activities in science policy, speaking frequently on the topic of research evaluation and metrics uses. She often acts as an expert advisor in European and global science policy initiatives. We really appreciate you are here with us, Sara, and thank you for coming. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to start by saying how great it is actually to, uh, to hear Anna Maria and Michael's keynotes uh, and to see that we're really now seeming to move uh, to a turning point, I think, in transforming open science and research assessment with really huge opportunities also to scale up uh, initiatives from the regional, like we've also seen in the Koara example, to the uh, global level. Um, let's start with the positive. I was also asked to drop bombs, so me and Manuel will do that. Um, I guess open science for me um, is about, of course, about publishing and about open, open access, but it also has great big potential uh, to change how academics work uh, by being more open, being more collaborative, um, it's about making research more transparent, breaking down the barriers that stop people from sharing their data. We've seen that also in the keynotes. Um, it encourages responsible behavior through um, in also open forms of peer review, sharing data, checking if others can actually replicate your research. And that is intended to make research more reliable, more trustworthy. When research is openly accessible, the idea is also that more people can actually um, make use of it, which makes it more valuable for society. And it's also obviously about working together and not in competition. It's also about including everyone and enabling scientific research to have a bigger impact. Um, since after World War II, science has really grown exponentially. After 1996, you see here on the slide, uh, 46 million papers have appeared with an annual growth rate of 4.10%, a uh, doubling time of 17.3 years, and a staggering 5.14 million papers were published in 2022 alone. Okay, that shows obviously how active research is, um, but it's also problematic. The yearly increase in the number of scientific papers brings up some really important problems. 
The first is obviously that that information overload can actually slow down research and discovery and the spread of knowledge. And the second issue is that the pressure to publish a lot can actually lead to rushed and sloppy research, which has also been shown already in findings from uh, the past 10 years in research on research. That's because there's a culture that says that you have to publish often um, in high-impact papers, uh, uh, journals, which makes it really hard to also double-check, to replicate and to confirm research findings. Uh, a last issue that I'd like to address here is that uh, there are more and more journals that was also mentioned in the keynote by Anna Maria, uh, some of which aren't very trustworthy. And that can make the progress, a process of reviewing papers less strict and let unverified and also bad science get published. So we really, um, of course, value the act of publishing as ac academics, uh, but we really need to think about how to manage this growth to make sure that scientific knowledge is still reliable and trustworthy. Now, the science system really needs to change because right now we focus too much on finding new things quickly, even if that means we might not be doing really good, replicable or useful research. We encourage scientists to focus on chasing after groundbreaking results and we judge success mainly by how many times scientists work gets cited by others. And that creates a culture in which short-termism and risk aversion thrive if we're not careful. And that's also driven by pressure to secure funding in very competitive four-year cycles often, which makes it really hard for researchers to actually envis envision projects and questions that are more long-term, that can be risky. Um, it also makes it hard for researchers in fields um, that have a big impact on society, but that go, don't get cited much. I think we will hear, hear more about that in the next uh, talk. Uh, the, like applied sciences, social sciences, humanities. As a result, research agendas of um, nations, of universities, of faculties and institutes uh, don't always focus on what society really needs. And also this makes um, competition more prominent, which have, has the effect that scientists are more likely, less likely to collaborate, which is really crucial, obviously, if you want to solve complex problems. So to make science better, we need to change our priorities. We really need to support a wider range of research and make sure our research actually helps society. This is the traditional view of science, which has some major problems. Uh, it tends to favor certain types of science, uh, like physics over others, like social science and humanities. And also it often values purely theoretical science more than practical real world solutions. And that means that we might miss out on solving important problems. Um, plus it also suggests that scientists should do research autonomously independently, without thinking about its impact on others or society. And finally, it assumes that science is always neutral and objective, but sometimes the things that scientists discover can actually have big ethical and social consequences. Those of you who have recently seen the movie Oppenheimer know what we're talking about. So to make science better, we really need to rethink these old ideas. This is the credibility cycle. Um, that is a way to visualize how scientists gain credit whilst creating knowledge. And it shows that scientific knowledge creation is a very complex process, which involves multiple actors and multiple translation steps. Funding enables researchers to assemble staff and acquire the necessary equipment for their research. And with these resources, scientists collect and analyze data through experiments and observations, and the resulting findings are then documented in articles, which undergo peer review and are published in scientific journals. 
As these articles then become part of the scientific literature, they contribute to the collective knowledge, ideally. And when others then recognize the quality and the uh, credibility, um, they get cited, which attracts more funding and resources. Now, that reward system in academia had, has its fair share of issues that needs addressing. One glaring problem is that society's needs often seem absent from this cycle, and it's becoming a hyper-competitive race for limited funds, um, in which there's little room for collaborative power of team science, multidisciplinarity, and also diversity. So the unwillingness to make data openly available, the prevalence of paywalls around research paper, uh, only makes that problem bigger. Quality is too often measured in quantitative terms, like the number of articles and citations, GIFs and HHS, or the amount of funding. And all these issues combined raise important questions about the true value and impact of research, and including research impact on society. This is a timeline of a decade of important declarations and recommendations and also initiatives aimed at transforming research culture, starting on the left with the DORA Declaration and the Leiden Manifesto from 2013 and 2015. And in the middle you see, for instance, the Manifesto for Reproducible Science from 2017, Folek Klasko's 2020 report on reforming research assessment in Latin America and the Caribbean, and on the right you also see the UNESCO recommendation, and COARA. And what strikes me when I look at that is that we are actually um, we started with the point about making the points about unintended negative consequences of simplistic metrics uses in research assessment and that we now take a more diverse set of goals uh, into account in advocating for open science and also responsible research assessment. I'm uh, nearing the end. Um, so responsible research assessment is a set of principles and practices aimed at making sure that research assessment processes are conducted in a way that is ethical and fair and also conducive to responsible conduct of research. So it really stresses this uh, umbrella approach to assessment to incentivize and reflect and reward the plural characteristics of high quality research in support of more diverse and inclusive research cultures. And that is really important because research assessment has the power to affect the culture of research and individual career trajectories in positive and also very negative ways. Researchers' well-being, the quality of evidence informing policymaking, and priorities in research and research funding. So this is why it's imperative that we continue to rethink evaluation. This is my final slide. So to continue to break the barriers in the way we assess researchers, that requires a global effort. It requires a combined effort of many different stakeholders, including funders and universities and journals and societies across disciplines and countries. And I really liked this uh, point that Anna Maria pointed out about a modular approach, which actually enables us to move forward without full hierarchical fiat of all actors. So um, research assessment and career evaluation systems need to align with the principles of open research. And what I really like about the UNESCO recommendation on open science that was already mentioned also in the keynotes is that it makes very clear that open science is not only about quality and integrity, but also very much about collective benefit, equity, fairness and sustainability. So it's part of a wider societal transformation, and that is because we need diverse perspectives and inclusive participation in science because of the huge, huge global challenges we are facing. So that is why we urgently need to change uh, the current research culture and to reward researchers for sharing and collaborating and engaging with society, as Manuel will also talk about. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah, for your very interesting presentation. Um, I'm going to give the floor now to Manuel Franco. He is one of our most outstanding citizen scientists in our national contest. He is very well known by the work that he is doing 
um, uh, as a social and urban epidemiologist all around the country and, of course, in Europe. He's an associated faculty at the University of Alcalá here in Madrid, and he's an, an, an adjunct faculty in two institutions at the United States of America, John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and the City University of New York Graduate School of Public Health. He has been the principal investigator of the European Research Council starting grant Heart Healthy Hoods, where he studied urban characteristics in relation to eating patterns, physical activity levels, smoking and alcohol consumption. He has also been the leading researcher of the participatory project on food in the city, Photovoice Villaverde. Thank you very much, Manuel, for being here today with us. Well, thank you very much to all of you for being here. Thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me. It's, uh, it's an extremely, well, I'm extremely happy and, and nervous to be here in my own city, uh, surrounded by people from all over the world talking about these very important issues on uh, how to open science and how to share, collaborate, and really transform uh, our societies for the better, which is what, at the end, we all want as, uh, as it was highlighted today in the morning in the, in the keynotes. And, it's, um, and I'm very happy to uh, welcome every one of you that is not from Madrid, especially to this house, who is the house of modern uh, art and the house of Pablo Picasso's Guernica uh, painting. So I encourage you to visit uh, all of it. So um, I am very concerned about how to transform research assessments, not, not, not much so much for me, because I'm getting old and old, uh, but for the next generations, for my students, and, uh, and really the people who are uh, going to hopefully transform, uh, transform the world. And in that sense, as uh, Pilar said, I was lucky enough to be trained in the United States, but also here, and, uh, and being part of uh, this conundrum of biomedical field uh, physician working with social scientists in different, uh, in different cities. So <clears throat> going straight to the point, uh, I would like to share just a couple of ideas on, on science translation. When we talk about collaboration, how do we bring evidence to translate, in my case, our cities? I work in urban health research. So the idea is how can we translate, how can we translate the evidence that we produce into better changes for your cities, Mexico City, Madrid, Barcelona, Leiden, Singapore, wherever we live, because 80% of the population worldwide will live in cities. At the same time, I'm very uh, concerned about how do we communicate science, and uh, for that, we have used uh, citizen science. So this is, this is uh, something that I'm very uh, happy to share uh, about, and I was lucky enough to get this funding from the European uh, Research Council, and already within uh, this project, we had tons of results that showed how, for example, living next to an exercise facility in the city of Madrid uh, had a direct impact on your, reach, on your risk of developing diabetes or obesity. So how the city is shaped, how the city is built, has an impact on uh, the most important uh, chronic diseases that uh, we have nowadays. So for us, it's important to publish this, uh, for my students, very important to publish this in Q1 journals, but for our society, it's very important that people in the cities, people who take decisions or where those exercise facilities are, know about our work. So that's why we engage with, for example, uh, the feed um, communication arm in this, in this case. Another example of uh, our work that we do, uh, how the retail food environment shapes the way our children eat in our cities. Something that we should be very concerned because childhood obesity is a huge problem uh, in Europe, uh, even more in the southern Europe. So again, it's not enough to publish this paper. It's, it's, it's enough to publish this paper for our students to get their master's degrees and their PhDs, but the idea is to change the, th the way our neighborhoods are in terms of the type of food uh, that we are offering our, uh, our children. Well, uh, uh, from a participatory action research point of view or citizen science point of view, we were working in two neighborhoods of the most underserved communities in the city of Madrid, 
uh, in, the, in uh, the district of Villaverde. And what we did is to collaborate with all these people, invite all these people to work with us for over a year. And what they did was taking pictures and discussing about urban food environment, something that I've been working for 20 years. And we took all their knowledge, all their ideas, to produce the necessary changes to improve these cities. Um, it's, it's honest to say that also we had an impact in terms of old research. So we published uh, papers that have been widely uh, published in, um, in old uh, journals. But it's also very important to say that, for example, um, when we published a good paper in public health or in urban health, we get 200 uh, citations. Well, we have this, uh, this uh, YouTube video of seven minutes that is uh, bilingual, it's English and Spanish, and has over now uh, 10,000 views. Um, even better, when this project was funded by the ERC, we were invited to go to the, uh, to the European Parliament, and we brought the exhibition. We, we, we had enough money to have an exhibition uh, that was actually funded by the City Hall of Madrid, so the city government of Madrid. We had a very good exhibition bringing all these um, photographs that you see there, and we brought actually those people from Villa Verde to speak at the Parliament and, uh, and, and share their data and their, uh, and their ideas. This, again, this translation effort will never show up in my CV because it has no, uh, no citations or has no impact on my research career. Probably, if somebody asks me what is the tip of your uh, career as a researcher in urban health, this, for sure, was an important, uh, an important moment. And now, uh, using my four minutes of fame with you, I will also share with you that after all these years, like the song, it's still crazy after all these years, uh, now I have a column in the Spanish newspaper El País on urban health. And I try my best, you might like it or not, uh, but I have like seven or eight entries on different aspects of urban health research. Of course, this, again, doesn't get any reference, doesn't get cited, but a lot of people in the area of urban planning, uh, citizen, uh, city uh, administrators, policymakers read these columns. Uh, people that will never use or never will read my, uh, my papers. So we are doing the best we can in terms of uh, Translation, translating all this research. Of course, if you go back, if you read those uh, columns, they're full of hyperlinks to the, to the references and to the, and to the big uh, journals. But again, I think that communicating this type of science in, for example, newspapers definitely has, a, has an impact. So again, just before I uh, thank you once again, I would like to make this point. So now, not just for me, but for the next generation of researchers, for early stage researchers, how do we change the way that research is assessed, the way that research is first published, then communicated, and then assessed in our CVs uh, in order to make science more uh, policy um, friendly, the way that science is communicated to our society, and the way that we engaged uh, regular people into, into science process. And again, I will reflect from my own experience. Uh, when I got this big grant from the European Research Council, I was invited to the Madrid General Assembly. And I was on, the, uh, on a panel of uh, um, public hospitals. I don't know why. But, so I was, I was the last one on the, uh, on the discussion with all the uh, policymakers, all the uh, parties in, uh, in Madrid were discussing for hours how much money do we spend on hospitals, how much money do we spend on, uh, on primary care, etc. At the very end of the, of the agenda was my project. No questions. Absolutely no questions from any policymaker in the General Assembly of the community of Madrid, of the region of Madrid, the richest region in Spain. No questions. Next. A year after, I was on the newspapers, I was uh, broadcasted in uh, uh, general radios, etc. Then all policymakers start to know you, then they call you, and they want you and your team to present uh, the results in their uh, city halls, reunions, administrations, etc. So that's when we start 
doing the translation of research into uh, into changes for the better in in, in cities or in uh, urban settings. So uh, again, I think this is the only way that we have to serve the needs from society, as uh, uh, as Sarah was saying, as being able to change the way we do science, but also the way science is portrayed and shared in our societies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Manuel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah and Manuel, for depicting the problem that we have right now on the table. And Sarah has brought us a general view in terms of the academic market. And Manuel is the perfect example that illuminates how the lack of incentives for changing the world and for improving society is a real problem that we, we have to deal with. So now we are going to face uh, two more presentations about what potential solutions we can develop for us to build a better science system. Our third speaker is Jensi Flores from Coara. Jensi is a passionate molecular biologist and she is dedicated to developing cutting edge biological cancer therapies. therapies. She is a Marie Curie Fellow and she's working on a project that brings together the Institute for Protein Design at the University of Washington, Seattle, and the Cancer Research Center at University College in Cork, Ireland. She's a member of the Executive Committee of the Global Joan Academy, a steering board member of the Coalition for Advancing Research Assessment, COARA, and an active member of the Joan Academy of Ireland. Jensi, thank you very much for being here, and the stage is yours. Hello, hi. Uh, it's an honor for me to be here representing early career researchers in DACOARA. As a native Honduran, my research career has taken a unique path, one filled with experiences outside the realms of academia. These experiences have shaped my perspective on science, leading me to believe and advocate for science as a social good accessible to all. Throughout my journey, I've witnessed how current research assessment practices can be a significant barrier for this vision. And as a member of the Global Young Academy, I was eager to co-lead a study shedding light of the extent of these practices worldwide. Over, two, uh, over 50 countries were uh, surveyed, and it was evident from this uh, service that researchers worldwide are predominantly evaluated based on their quantity outputs, mainly assessed through bibliometric indicators. Therefore, it, is, it, it became clear that to make science truly accessible to all and aligned with the ever-evolving needs of our society and our planet, we need to change this system. In addition, we need to shift the focus from quantity to quality emphasizing values that are crucial for trust in science, such as openness, collaboration, and integrity. I was thrilled with the opportunity to participate in a consultation process launched by the European Con uh, Commission. This consultation brought together nearly 400 organizations from 40 countries, questioning and recognizing the need for a reform. Together, we proposed a way forward. At, uh, with a transformative agreement grounded in shared principles and actions and the rights of a community committed for change. Now, the agreement to reform research assessment centers in 10 overarching principles, which place research integrity and ethics at the core safeguard the freedom of uh, scientific research and respect the autonomy of research organizations. Signatories of this agreement pledge to, four, to follow four core commitments, recognizing the diversity of contributions and careers in research, based assessment primarily on qualitative evaluation 
and abandon the inappropriate use of research metrics and rankings. Signatories also commit to support, um, to allocate resources to support this reform. They commit to develop new assessment criteria, tools, and processes, and importantly, to, uh, to share and exchange best practices to enable mutual learning. So to achieve this systemic change, a coalition of committed organizations was formally formed. The Quora is a community. It provides the crucial platforms for fostering collaboration and knowledge sharing, along with governance structures that enable collective efforts towards a common goal. Quora operates under the governance of a general assembly, which encompasses all members. It's overseen by a steering board, which is elected, and where working groups and national chapters serve as the primary collaborative structures, facilitating bottom-up knowledge generation and sharing. All the work in the Quara is supported by a secretariat. Now, the Quara was launched in December 2022, where 300 members elected the steering board, approved the, the governance documents and preliminary work plan. plan. Since then, in less than one year, our membership has surged to over 600 or, uh, members, no, 500 members, sorry, and 600 signatories. Among these, Spain, I'm happy to say, leads the way in membership. Now, as mentioned earlier, working groups play a pivotal role in CORA's mission. They operate as uh, community of practices and propose their proposed bottom-up by the members. To date, we have launched 10 working groups, and a second call for working groups is currently open. I encourage you to submit the expression of interest uh, for new working groups by October the 2nd. N additionally, national chapters provide a platform to address region-specific issues. One chapter per country is supported. And currently, there are five national chapters, including one for Spain, as Michael mentioned earlier. National chapters can lead collective efforts to reform in the context of a country and a region. And ideally, all members from a country and a region will engage and interact with their national chapter. Now, more information can be found on our website and our online platforms. I encourage you to join our community and follow our efforts. I thank you very much for the space given and for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Jensi, very much for showing us what's being done from the European side to try to solve this problem. When you mentioned that Spain is the most, um, the country that where we have more institutions in Coara, maybe it can sound like good news the first time you think about that, but maybe it's because we have a bigger problem than some other countries, so that is why we are all there. <laughs> so it might be one explanation. Um, I'm gonna give the floor now to our last speaker, Pablo Bomonaro. He is going to use his Spanish for the presentation, so please, please use your headsets for translation if you need them. Um, Pablo is a postdoc researcher in social science, childhood, childhood and youth. He holds a PhD in social science from the University of Buenos Aires in Argentina. He is an independent researcher at CONICET He's a professor of history at the University of Buenos Aires and co-coordinator of the Policy and Youth Studies Group. He is the research director of the Latin American Council of Social Sciences, CLACSO, and the Latin American Forum for Scientific Assessment, FOLEC CLACSO. He is going to speak about a very similar initiative in the Latin American side that was COARA is. So one of the the objective that we have in this panel session is that bring together all the solutions that are being developed in the globe and try to make them 
work together towards a common end. So thank you very much, Pablo. The stage is yours. Thank you very much, Pilar. Muchas gracias. Voy a hablar en español, justamente como Pilar adelantó. El multilingüismo y mi lengua nativa hace que hable hoy en español. Muchas gracias también por, por aceptar eso. En castellano sería, ¿no? Mejor, mejor dicho. Bueno, desde Claxo, justamente desde el Consejo Latinoamericano de Ciencias Sociales, eh, esta presentación que voy a compartir hoy con ustedes también fue, digamos, realizada, elaborada por eh, Dominique Babini y por Laura Robelli, a quienes agradezco y a quienes saludo también en vivo porque sé que esto está siendo transmitido y siendo filmado y también un reconocimiento hacia, hacia ellas. Como, como esta primer placa dice, el Foro Latinoamericano de Evaluación Científica es una iniciativa regional alineada con la evaluación académica y científica responsable y la ciencia abierta. CLACSO es una red de, que hoy contiene eh, 898, casi 900 centros de investigación y de formación en 56 países, porque si bien es una red con una perspectiva latinoamericana y caribeña, se ha convertido en los últimos 10 o 15 años en una institución también mundial que desde el sur global propone dialogar con el norte global justamente. Como bien pueden ver, las instituciones de la red Claxo publican aproximadamente 400 revistas en acceso abierto, no en APC, eh, y más de 3.000 libros en acceso abierto también, no B. BPC. El repositorio Claxo, como ustedes pueden ver ahí, tiene más de 100.000 textos completos de centros y instituciones miembros, entre artículos, libros, revistas, capítulos de libros y en los últimos tiempos también estamos incursionando en diversas piezas, archivos y materiales multimedia para llevar también esta ciencia abierta hacia otros formatos. La campaña que promueve el acceso abierto no, eh, no digamos comercial en América Latina, en el Caribe, que desde 1999 Claxo sostiene, junto a otras iniciativas de acceso abierto en la región y en el mundo. Entre las alianzas principales que podemos mencionar está la de Redalic Amelica, que juntos entonces tenemos una colección conjunta de 1025 revistas de calidad en ciencias sociales y humanidades y artes en acceso abierto. Pero por supuesto, Claxo también trabaja con la Tindex, con Cielo y con otros eh, indexadores eh, latinoamericanos justamente promoviendo el acceso abierto, en algunos casos con algunos matices, pero queriendo trabajar conjuntamente por este, por este fin. Todas las convocatorias de investigación que Claxo promueve requieren de una descripción de cómo y dónde los resultados de investigación estarán disponibles en acceso abierto. Los grupos de trabajo Claxo, hoy en día Claxo tiene 87 grupos de trabajo con casi 5.000 miembros, promueven la ciencia abierta y participativa y expresan un compromiso abierto de los actores sociales academia, política pública, movimientos sociales eh, y un diálogo abierto con otros sistemas de conocimiento. Ahí en la foto ustedes pueden ver uno de nuestros foros de, eh, que se digamos, realizó en Fortaleza, Brasil, hace algunos meses, donde fue un espacio de discusión y de diálogo social justamente entre academia, decisores de política pública y movimientos sociales. Y justamente en septiembre del año pasado, Claxo lanzó esta iniciativa denominada Plataformas para el Diálogo Social, que es una alianza que Claxo tiene con la cooperación sueca, con la agencia ASDI o SIDA de Cooperación Sueca para el Desarrollo, y que se eh, propone la producción de conocimiento situado, crítico y basado en evidencia con alto impacto en la definición de políticas, la opinión pública y la transformación positiva de las condiciones de vida de las poblaciones más empobrecidas, oprimidas, discriminadas y subalternizadas. Estas, estas plataformas para el diálogo social están basadas en la ciencia abierta, todas sus producciones son en acceso abierto, libre y gratuito, es decir, no comercial. Bueno, ahí están las ocho dimensiones que abordan estas plataformas, no las voy a leer para no usar más tiempo, pero tienen que ver con las principales problemáticas que Claxo identifica en la agenda del mundo contemporáneo, 
vuelvo a decir, siempre de una perspectiva latinoamericana y caribeña y con base en los principios de la ciencia abierta. Estas plataformas son ciencia abierta llevada a la práctica, llevada a la acción. ¿Cuáles son hoy entonces los principales desafíos para una reforma de la evaluación de la investigación en América Latina y el Caribe? Porque como bien adelantó Pilar, estamos trayendo aquí la experiencia de Claxo Folec, del Foro Latinoamericano de Evaluación Científica que lanzamos en 2019, quizá no lo dije al inicio, en 2019, justamente en México. Y por ejemplo, la querida Ana María Cheto fue, fue y es una aliada fundamental en esta iniciativa y en todo lo que Claxo digamos, promueve en acceso abierto y en ciencia abierta. Rápidamente, cuatro puntos. El cultural de la excelencia a la calidad de la investigación en diálogo con la relevancia social y el compromiso social. El segundo punto, el político. Alinear los sistemas de evaluación regionales, investigación, carreras, instituciones, con una evaluación cualitativa respaldada por indicadores cuantitativos situados y principios y valores de la ciencia abierta. El tercero, infraestructuras compartidas, interoperables, federadas, sostenibles, que apoye la bibliodiversidad y el multilingüismo. Y el cuarto, comunidades, ciencia en equipo, ciencia colectiva, evaluación de grupos, proyectos, inclusiva y equitativa, reconocimiento de diversas trayectorias profesionales, diversas contribuciones, enfoques inter y transdisciplinarios, abordando problemas y no solamente disciplinas. Avanzando en la iniciativa de Claxofolec, una iniciativa regional situada, una vez más lo digo, desde América Latina y el Caribe, alineada con los principios de la ciencia abierta global. Claxofolec desarrolla acciones de movilización, diagnóstico y propuestas sobre evaluación responsable. Ahí tienen algunos de los documentos producidos, por supuesto todos en acceso abierto. Herramientas de política sobre, sobre evaluación responsable de la investigación, RRI, eh, sistemas de información actuales, multilingüismo y bibliodiversidad, promoción de revistas nacionales y una consulta, hemos digamos, realizado una consulta regional sobre revisión por pares. Eh, además, Claxo Folec integra el Comité Ejecutivo de Dora, eh, produce documentos de investigación sobre evaluación de propuestas orientadas a misiones y formas innovadoras de evaluación responsable de la investigación, por ejemplo, junto al IDRC de Canadá. Y participamos también en el informe de evaluación El futuro de la investigación, junto con la Inter Academy, Inter Academy Partnership, con la Global Young Academy que recién Jensi mencionó, y con el ISC, por ejemplo, junto a Sara de Risque, quien, con quien también compartimos desafíos, iniciativas, espacios y proyectos. Eh, nuestra declaración de principios y propuestas, ahí tienen un código QR para poder descargarla, una nueva evaluación de la investigación hacia una ciencia socialmente relevante en América Latina y el Caribe. Esta fue una declaración colaborativa que dialoga con otras, por ejemplo, la de UNESCO, que se mencionó antes, con Dora, también fue aprobada en junio del 2022 por la Asamblea de Claxo por 900 instituciones de 52 países y al momento cuenta con más de 300 adhesiones, ahí está entre universidades, centros de investigación, revistas científicas, consejos eh, científicos, tecnológicos y de innovación a nivel nacional, diferentes agencias científicas y también repositorios. Invitamos a todos, por supuesto, y todas a conocer y a ojalá firmar y compartir esta declaración con 14 principios y propuestas para una ciencia abierta situada. Eh, justamente transformando la evaluación de la investigación para las próximas generaciones. Algunos puntos que proponemos y que estamos implementando desde Claxo Folec. 
cooperar con una reforma integral, articulada e incremental de los sistemas de, de evaluación alineada con los principios y valores de la ciencia abierta, fortalecer y mejorar la interoperabilidad de las infraestructuras digitales abiertas y recompensar y reconocer las prácticas de ciencia abierta. Manuel lo decía, ¿cómo coloco esto en mi currículum? Tiene que ver con reconocer y recompensar las prácticas de ciencia abierta. Alejarse del uso de indicadores bibliométricos de impacto de revistas como criterio de calidad. Fomentar la comunicación académica orientada a modelos no comerciales y sostenibles basados en el trabajo colaborativo y solidario. Generar, o estamos generando, sinergias entre FOLEC, CLACSO y COARA, por ejemplo, en reformas participativas y situadas alineadas con la ciencia abierta, foros de experiencias y aprendizajes, laboratorios transformadores e instancias supranacionales de coordinación y seguimiento de acciones. Cambio cultural a través de la participación de una diversidad de actores académicos, especialmente los investigadores iniciales, en formación, el diálogo intergeneracional es fundamental en esto, pero también incorporando actores no académicos. Y por último entonces, este creciente impulso para la reforma hacia modos, procesos y herramientas más amplias e inclusivas para evaluar la investigación, promover espacios colaborativos y sinergias con base en los principios de la ciencia abierta. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much, Pablo. Um, now we have the QR for you to enter into Mentimeter, for you to digitally send your questions, but you can also raise your hands and the microphone will be given to you if you have uh, questions that you want to raise directly. I don't really see. I'm going to start with mine. When you are typing in your... There's a question? Okay. Okay, there. Um, where's the microphone? Um, I think they are looking for the microphone. In the meantime, I'm going to start with one of mine. Um, I would like to know if in the solution of the problem, have you considered diversity, equity and inclusiveness as one of the issues? Because what we've been seeing right now is that the incentives are very much oriented to publication, and that is a problem for many reasons. But also, there are some other issues that beyond the fact that the main vehicle for communication, communicating science is a, is, a, is a paper, besides that, maybe there are some issues involved in whatever we communicate and whatever it is evaluated that involves equity, diversity, and inclusiveness. So I would like you to uh, this question is for Jensi and for Pablo. Ahora, ahora respondemos o sí. hacemos una serie de preguntas. Sí. Ah, okay. Ahora, now, please. Perfect, perfect. Now, Jensi, por favor. I think that uh, for, from the core perspective, this is central. Uh, this is uh, um, ingrained in the principles, and it's uh, been part uh, of the formation of the community. Uh, it's recognizing diversity in all terms and uh, making, uh, working towards a more equitable science. And uh, there's been a, a big drive to be as inclusive as possible. And uh, we want members from other organizations to come in and join our community uh, worldwide, you know? We want a worldwide community, a global community, because research uh, is a global enterprise. We want researchers from all career stages. Uh, I am particularly interested in early career uh, researchers because I'm an early career researcher. Um, but we want researchers from all stages to be part of creating the solutions because there's not one size fit all. Uh, we will need to come together and uh, discuss what are the better solutions in each case and scenario. Sí, eh, rápidamente creo que El desafío de reconocer diversidades dialoga también con contrarrestar desigualdades. Porque, por ejemplo, las desigualdades intergeneracionales 
en la práctica científica, las desigualdades de género, por ejemplo, son, son también muy eh, digamos, fuertes, y reconocer diversidades, por ejemplo, en América Latina, en el Caribe, de diferentes formas de producir conocimiento y de comunicar este conocimiento, tiene que ver también entonces con pensar en las prácticas concretas de la comunidad científica, pero no solo de la comunidad académica y científica, sino también del diálogo con los grupos sociales, que muchas veces producen conocimiento y no están reconocidos como tales. Es decir, no solo la apropiación social del de, de conocimiento o la traducción, sino la incorporación a, la, a las formas de producir conocimiento legitimadas, validadas, consagradas, de otros modos de hacer ciencia y de comunicar la ciencia. Y un último punto con esto, es muy importante y desde Claxo Polec intentamos hacerlo, trabajar en conjunto con los sistemas científicos nacionales, con los organismos nacionales de ciencia, tecnología, innovación, porque son finalmente ellos los que van moldeando, modulando, sea por recompensa económica, o sea por acreditación de avances en las carreras académicas, al menos en ciencias sociales, humanidades y artes, son ellos, digo, finalmente los que van a sancionar los principios que guíen la práctica de la comunidad científica y académica. Así que la alianza con los organismos nacionales y con los sistemas nacionales es muy importante para poder lograr cambios efectivos en estos temas. Contributions. We thank okay? you. The yes. Uh, yes. Thank you as well, Anna Maria and Michael, from this morning. Wonderful and very inspiring contributions. I come from Montpellier University, but before I was working in South America, and I have behind me a career as plant genetics and biotechnologies. And I guess my question is more related with integrative governance to open access and open data. And I give you an example for my area. In South America, we have been quite good catching up with the technical development to produce data, sequencing, etc. But we have no big data to uh, uh, create a platform for analyzing the data. When we publish, one of the requests is that we open the data. We give li open access to the, all the sequencing data. We finish publishing not in the high-ranking journals, Back then, scientists from Europe, from the US, do what is very fashionable today, is a um, meta-analysis of multiple cases, and they access the data. And they publish in Nature and Science, and they don't acknowledge the contribution of the original sources of this data. So how can we integrate what we are talking today with other initiatives tackling these issues of equity, equity, what we call today Global North, Global South, and how it's not just given infrastructure to open science, but also incrementing our capacities for these other uh, technical, analytical issues that are the way to put us talking in the same language and putting us in the same page. So who wants to take this? Sara? <laughs> I think this is on your side. <laughs> I put it in your plate. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the one of the challenges in I, I guess in transitioning from the one uh, system to the other. Um, so you're um, actually encouraging, promoting, doing open research, open sharing, and other people benefit and don't acknowledge, and they publish in high impact journals. That's not where we want to be. Um, one of the things that I like about thinking about transforming research assessment is that the focus is starting to, to move towards quality, not necessarily quality criteria only, but looking at the process of doing research and acknowledging how you got there. Um, and that's one of the ways, I think, in which we can start to maybe push back against this focus only on kind of the output but to encourage people also to account for how they got there and account for the data sets that they are, have been using and where they, where they uh, got it from. Um, we're obviously not there, uh, but I think that is one of the, one of the uh, opportunities that we ri have right now. It's also complex because that means that we will have a situated, context-specific uh, assessment system. 
Uh, but that, that is, I think, very important, a process orientation and a, an orientation towards what is the purpose of the work. So you start there. That's also what, what Koara, I think, does very well. So to promote uh, a value-based assessment and to promote looking at the process and the di direction uh, instead of only uh, the outcomes and the outputs. Yeah. Um, there are so many questions in the Mentimeter, and we are going to give preference to the people on site. So, Ana Maria has a question. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, and thank you very much for this very interesting panel. Um, I have a couple of questions. One of them. Um, refers to the, um, uh, the reason for so much assess assessment. Um, I remember in the 1970s, um, uh, there was a shift. There used to be assessments for diagnostic purposes in particular. Uh, but then started the uh, uh, individual research assessments. And, and we have now uh, systems that um, condition the promotion of scientists uh, uh, on uh, their good per individual performance. Um, do you, when you are thinking of reforming the research assessment, do you also have this diagnostic function uh, in mind? Because I have not heard about this part, which I think is still an important um, reason for doing so much assessment, or not so, or perhaps not s as much as is being done, because we are multi, uh, continuously being assessed as, as researchers. There's, I, in my view, too much individual research assessment. So that was that would be one question, and another that this related. I remember um, I used to put in my CV only what counted for my promotions, which were the the papers, conferences, etc. But I, I have always done many other things, and I'm sure that is the case for many other scientists, perhaps of the older generations. No? Uh, but um, so, does everything have to be included in our academic um, curriculum? Um, because I have other motivations. I don't work for the incentives, for the institutional incentives. And I see that uh, you are mentioning incentives all the time, you know, in your research assessment reforms. Um, what about the other more, let's say, other kind of incentives that we have uh, that are not assessed? You know? So many other things we do. And, and the other question would be about the to that would be specifically for Pablo when he mentioned that they're looking for um, quantitative indicators of situated uh, science and interdisciplinary science. And this is a challenge. Uh, do, do they have to be quantitative? And, and, and in, in, if this is so, how do you measure? assessment in the interdisciplinary uh, field, let's say. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to pass this one, the second one, to Manuel. Um, um, maybe, Jensi, you want to address that one as well? You want to address that one? No, I thought that you were talking. <laughs> sorry? Uh, no, it's fine. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Um, regarding the incentives, mm -hmm. how do you get your young researchers to get involved in some other research activities that really can change the world with the lack of incentives that Ana Maria was mentioning. And how do you convince them when the, we are involved in this crazy career that the, the, if you are the last one, you will be out of the picture. Um, how do you get them involved in these activities? Yes, please. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it, this is a, a question that comes both from Anna Maria and from the Mentimeter. I feel very much appealed, yeah. It's an interpretation. Um, well, it, it, it's, it's very difficult, to be honest, um, because especially in countries like Spain, where uh, 
pursuing a, an early stage research career is, is, is tough. It's really tough. Uh, it's really tough in, in general, but it's tough in certain areas, uh, research areas, and it's tougher for um, low income uh, students or low income researchers, and it's tougher for women. So how do, engage, how do you um, engage them into um, research topics or research methods or research uh, areas that will not necessarily get them uh, fast into a, into a tenure track or into a, into a, in, into a decent job? Um, that's, that's difficult. And, uh, and in, in my case, in my group, I think I was able to take the risk because I had all this support from the ERC, from other national, uh, um, from other national uh, agencies, etc., where we had the money to do this type of outside-the-box project. But, uh, but I needed for them to publish, to publish in, 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 good, uh, in, in good journals. And, uh, and again, uh, right now in, in, in my group, we have brilliant uh, students, brilliant female students, actually, that need to get their master's degrees and their uh, doctoral degrees, and we were discussing this, and the requirements is that they have one or two Q1 journal, uh, publications, and there's no way out. So how do I convince them to uh, use the repository that we were talking before, and, I, and, and, and I, I'm positive that this is the future, where they are playing with their own uh, lives. So it's, uh, it's uh, of course, we need to be creative, we need to be motivated, and they are, but they also need to pay the rent. So, um... <laughs> yeah. Um. I'm going to jump on again because we are running out of time and there are many very interesting questions. I'm going to keep the last one of you, Ana Maria, for afterwards because um, it goes directly to the most voted, the second most voted in Mentimeter. But the first one is that uh, it, it speaks about the hyper competition in science and how it is really harming the mental well being of researchers, especially young researchers. Um, I'm going to I'm going to uh, also include what I wrote in my own questions about the concept of excellence. Do we really need to be excellent all the time? Do policemen, teachers, policy makers, are they excellent, really? Are they self-assessing themselves <laughs> under the excellent concept? <laughs> So being excellent all the time, or the need to prove excellence all the time, is really damaging mental health of our research community. So I want a brief reflection from Sara, Jensi, and Pablo about whether or not you have in considered this issue into your research assessment reform exercises. Sara. Brief. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Yeah. <laughs> we have. Um, no, I, th I think uh, uh, the, the thing about uh, the policies for excellence, they emerged around the same time in which this evaluation machine started to emerge. In the 70s, early 80s, beginning of the 90s. It, you can explain that also by looking at the political systems. That we, so it's a very complex question, but I think the policies for excellence uh, figured prominently in those types of uh, arenas in these decades and we now really need to move away from that kind of policy. That doesn't mean that we don't want high quality research, but I think we need to really think through what that means without relying on externalized, uh, totally flat notions of excellence and externalized accountability regimes. Um, that are very um, exclusive and not inclusive. So that will take also a while to rebuild. And I think that is the work we need to do. So don't start to develop uh, quick uh, indicators for open science or, or new lists and rankings, but really rethink that notion of quality collectively. Okay, I'm gonna follow up on that um, using Ana Maria's intervention and one of the questions. Jensi, please. Yeah. So uh, the definition of excellent, uh, excellence has been a topic of a debate uh, uh, in the steering board of CORA. And uh, I remember, I think we had a very lively conversation with Eva, who is a uh, present also steering board member of the CORA. But uh, in general, it's uh, 
it, we think you know excellence is not as I mentioned not a universal, and it's not if we stop like seeing excellence as a comparison to one other, but as a, as you, your best performance or like your best as being uh, in a specific context. I guess that that will change how we see each other and um, remove a lot of the, you know, very unhealthy competition that we have with each other and bring more together, more of us together, yeah? Yeah, Luis. Um, ¿Es Pilar? ¿Yo? O? Sí, por favor. Ah, okay. Eh, rápidamente también, como decía Sara, brief, porque podemos tener 15 minutos para esta respuesta que no. Eh, a, a ver, por un lado creo que es muy importante y hay, y hay coincidencias y, y vinculado a la, a, a la última, digamos, pregunta, eh, abandonar o, o ir eh, discutiendo estas cuestiones de la, de la excelencia para trasladarnos, creo, como decía yo antes, a un concepto de calidad, porque sí creo o sea, todos estamos convencidos, todas, que hay que, digamos, ser evaluados y hay que, digamos, evaluar. El tema es cómo, para qué, con qué procesos y con qué indicadores también, como Ana María antes preguntaba, voy a decir algo muy, muy breve sobre eso. Entonces, creo que movernos a discutir no tanto excelencia, sino que es calidad en diálogo con la relevancia social, que creo que tiene que ver con la ciencia, digamos, abierta. O sea, pensar en la relevancia de, digamos, el conocimiento, no solo para pensar en una ciencia aplicada, si uno podría pensar en esa distinción, sino en toda la ciencia, pero poder pensar en la relevancia social, en el, en el, en el, en el, en el impacto social y en la vinculación con las problemáticas sociales. Creo, entonces, que es importante poder discutir estos estos principios o, o estos valores, estas normas, vuelvo a decir, con los sistemas nacionales fuertemente, porque finalmente son ellos los que, los que tienen como la última palabra. Muchas iniciativas, digamos, regionales, como es Folec Claxo, como es Coara y como son tantos otros, sin duda, digamos, UNESCO también, sin duda están poniendo eh, algunas, algunas bases o están sentando algunas discusiones, pero si no logramos involucrar y convencer a los sistemas nacionales, eh, algunos cambios son muy difíciles y me muevo ahí a eh, el tema también de la importancia de la inversión pública. Es algo muy discutido últimamente, se habla de aumentar inversión privada en ciencia, innovación, tecnología, que sin duda hay que hacerlo. Pero algunas cuestiones vinculadas con desigualdades de género, vinculada con lo intergeneracional, vinculada con el reconocimiento de otros saberes, si no es con inversión pública, es muy difícil de eh, poder, digamos, hacer, porque la inversión privada está destinada a otros focos, a otros objetivos que pueden ser válidos también, pero que no logran eh, revertir o contrarrestar algunas desigualdades que es lo que estamos hablando. Y una última discusión tiene que ver con también una, una cierta dicotomía, un pensamiento binario entre lo cuantitativo y lo cualitativo. Por eso yo mencionaba ir hacia una evaluación más cualitativa, pero también discutir los indicadores cuantitativos. A eso iba, porque si no estamos regalando alguna discusión a algunas agencias que se van a dedicar a lo cuantitativo y lo que pareciera ser objetivo y serio, y uno está discutiendo eh, sobre ética o sobre principios o, so, o sobre valores, que es muy importante, pero también en la construcción de indicadores cuantitativos está la ética, los principios y la relevancia social de la ciencia. En América Latina hay discusiones en Argentina, en Chile, Colombia, México, con todas sus, digamos, complejidades sobre estos temas y hay avances hacia la construcción de indicadores cuantitativos que logren incorporar o capturar estas discusiones que estamos dando. ¿no? Y creo que eso es muy importante también poder ampliarlo y poder sostenerlo. Thank you very much, Pablo, because you really touched the last point that we want to address. We are out of time, but because the discussion is being very intense um, and the Mentimeter is full of questions, I'm going to take that one of the, um, of the indicators. There are quite a few questions here about when are we going to have new indicators for evaluating, but I want to put together two ideas that had been addressed by Sara and Ana Maria about the externalization of the concept of quality, which is, I think, something very important here. Um, the problem of research assessment has 
very oftenly um, understood as a, as a principal and agent problem in which a principal has a need, um, a policy maker, decision maker has a need, and because it lacks information and it lacks control on the situation, hires an agent for the agent to provide the service. The, uh, the more external the agent is, the more dependent the, the principal is on the agent. So in the current research assessment system, the agent is very far away from the principal, and it has its own agenda. A very important one, as we have been seeing in previous presentations. So is it really the question, when are we having new indicators? Or the question is how much we want to, uh, to take back the concept of quality closer to the principal and to the peer review and the research communities and um, sorting the distance between the agent and the principal. Can you go on that, Sarah? <laughs> <laughs> you said it well, so I, I'm well. I'm going to ask the, the four of you, <laughs> because minute, Sarah, minute, no. the four of you, because we are about to close the session, so I'm going to ask the four of you. I think that is an excellent diagnosis. Um, back in 1995, uh, Ted Porter wrote this great book, Trust in Numbers, in which I, I think you're also referring that to that kind of thinking. It's a larger kind of issue when we start to trust in numbers that has to do with the distance between indeed the principal and the agent, a short, short version. Very excellent historical analysis of the rise of statistics, etc. And that applies here too. Um, you also pointed out, of course, that there's a certain need for relevant criteria by certain agencies, but I do think one of the steps we need to take is to bring also uh, publishing infrastructures and all kinds of kind of scholarly communication efforts back to uh, the scientific communities. We want more digital sovereignty. We also want to think more kind of uh, context sensitive about quality uh, criteria or have a good conversation about quality between your supervisor and your PhD candidates. Where do they want to go? Can you have those conversations when you talk about Q1 journals? Mm -hmm. so, so that kind of effort also requires very different forms of leadership in academia. Uh, so I'm bringing in all kinds of um, elements of the system that we need to think and rethink in tandem, whilst also um, uh, being in a playing field that is heavily commercialized. Um, and, and governments also want things, indeed. Mm -hmm. So it's very complex, but I do uh, uh, acknowledge the diagnosis, and I do think that the initiatives that we're seeing are starting to do that kind of work, and also including and co-creating um, notions of quality. I'm not saying necessarily m immediately criteria, but having the conversation, d a different type of conversation of what we're actually doing and what is considered relevant. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sarah. Manuel. <coughs> so I would say that, that for improving research assessment, uh, what is happening right now here is, is fundamental. And actually, the fact that this type of uh, open science fair uh, happens, and everybody in, in the academia, or in my institution, or in other institutions, or in Carlos III, or in the Ministerio, etc., they know what is happening and is being discussed here is fundamental. Because at some point in your career, you will be not only uh, uh, assessed by your age index or your um, Google Scholar or ORCID or this is never ending discussions, is you will be assessed by a group of four or five people. And if these four or five people have never been in this uh, discussion, there's no quality, there's no discussion about where are we going in terms of research. They will be judging you just by the checklist that they have been using for 50 years. And this has happened to me many times. Uh, so I think that Communicating what is going on in this discussion here is fundamental because we have to reach all those old men, mostly old men, that will decide <laughs> our future as uh, early researchers. Thanks, Manuel. Jensi? I agree, and th uh, maybe the only thing I would add is to bring into the conversation a wide um, community of stakeholders from different backgrounds and different experiences mm -hmm. because uh, it may uh, be that some things that fit in some context, it, they won't just work elsewhere. So if we come together uh, and uh, see all, and learn together, then we have a better chance. Thank you, Jensi. Pablo? 
Final. Sí, coincido con lo que dijeron antes. Eh, creo que eh, los modos colaborativos, las iniciativas colaborativas, los espacios multiactorales y multisectoriales, como es esta feria y como es esta misma mesa, este mismo panel, son el camino porque tiene que ver con el reconocimiento, tiene que ver con la diversidad, tiene que ver con encontrar lo común desde diferentes perspectivas y diferentes puntos de vista y tiene que ver entonces con poder reconocer prácticas diversas, pero poder construir criterios, eh, digamos, comunes para poder justamente incorporar o reconocer esas prácticas diversas. Algo que voy a decir que quizás no es como cierre, o sea, que no sirve como cierre, pero que me quedó pendiente, tiene que ver también que todos estos debates tienen que poder expresarse en las infraestructuras de ciencia abierta. Que no hemos conversado tanto, pero hubo, eh, digamos, una pregunta tuvo que ver indirectamente con cómo pensamos las infraestructuras en base a estos principios y tiene que ver también con lo que Ana María preguntaba eh, acerca de lo cual y, y lo cuantitativo y lo multi e interdisciplinar. Entonces creo que ahí hay también un foco para poder poner, ya no en esta mesa, pero para poder también poder pensar de manera colaborativa y de manera, digamos, conjunta. ¿no? Yeah, digital sovereignty and digital infrastructures for open science. We didn't make it. We are out of time already. Thank you very much to the four panelists for this excellent work. So now let's go for lunch. Perfect. Sorry, um, before going to lunch, we are going to take a picture of all the group here. So if you can come here over.